Amazing. So today I'm going to be sharing my story, how I found my calling to be an apostle. Uh, right now, revival is now. It is now for America and the world. And in this revival, God is restoring his fivefold ministry to the body of Christ. He is restoring apostles and prophets as we don't see them by and large in the body of Christ. But in this revival, it's the end time revival and God is restoring what we see in the Acts church to be in the church today. So that it wouldn't just be uh, only salvation happening, but that there would be miracles too, healing and deliverance that it wouldn't only be salvation, healing, and deliverance happening in the revival, but that the church would be beautified, that, that it wouldn't be a, a passing, fading revival, but that what we see in the Acts Church, the foundation, the characteristics of the Acts Church would be in place because that's how revival can be sustained and last. It's not supposed to be revival. You know, we shouldn't, aim for past revivals in the, in the regard, of, in the fact of like, they're here and then they leave, but we should want to see revival not be a seasonal thing, not just a one year, two year, three year thing, but that it would last and that we would go glory to glory. And this is gonna be the best revival that we have ever seen, the greatest, because it's not fading, it's lasting and there's so much that God is doing in his body of restoring what we see in the Acts Church, God's original blueprint structure of how church should be in the body of Christ today. So when you look in the Acts Church, you find certain characteristics. One of the characteristics is the fivefold ministry, that there were apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers, all equipping the body of Christ. This is what God's restoring today, so that the body of Christ would be fully built up and mature, edified, able to be a powerful vessel of God. In this revival, we're seeing God move in a new way. We're seeing him choose vessels that people haven't seen God use before, like the type of vessels we haven't seen God use before. Um, we, are, we are seeing what this verse says in 1 Corinthians 1 27, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So we are seeing this right now, God choosing foolish and weak things, meaning choosing vessels that people wouldn't see to be qualified people wouldn't pick on their own. They would never think in their own that God would use them powerfully, that they have any business being in ministry, discounted. These are the types of people that God is, is calling now and using now. This is God's way of working. This is what we saw for, with, with Moses, how Moses ended up murdering somebody. And it just, could not have been imagined that he would be the one chosen. Um, he ran away from his home where he realized he had been lied to about where he came from and um, was now a shepherd, but yet God called him to be a mouthpiece of him and lead millions of God's children out of Egypt into the promised land. So we see that with Moses, we see uh, David was looked past completely by even his own father. And your parents are supposed to be the ones that don't look past you, but his own father looked past him. When it, when it came time for Prophet Samuel to anoint a king, he said, I'm going to anoint someone in your household. And the father of David literally lined up every one of his sons except for David. He thought there's no way that David would be anointed king, but that was who God chose. That's a weak and foolish thing, weak and foolish one that God chose. And this is what we see with the disciples uh, that Jesus called. They were, they were normal people. They were 
with normal jobs. There were fishermen, there was tax collectors who were considered so sinful, so corrupt, and the people who would have thought to be chosen to be disciples of the Messiah, they would have thought it would be Jewish leaders or children of Jewish leaders in the family of Jewish leaders like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That would have been the wise thing to do in their eyes and it would be weak and it would be very strange and foolish to choose the people whom Jesus chose. So this has always been God's way. This is whom God anoints. But um, we have not seen that by and large uh, for a lot of the body of Christ today. We see a lot of self-appointing or we see a lot of just, you know, someone f going by feelings, but, but not having confirmation of being called by God, of being anointed. We see a lot of people go through the traditions of recent Christian culture. By recent, I mean for several decades of, you know, going through seminary school and, you know, being, um, getting the degree and considering that to be, okay, you're qualified. But that's not what makes God to qualify a person. Anybody can go through school, but it doesn't mean that they are actually anointed and called by God. So, um, in this revival, we're seeing that characteristic of the Acts Church and how God has moved from the Old Testament to New Testament of using the weak and foolish things that people looked over, um, people no one would guess. And um, as I share my story today, this message should encourage you and, and, and teach you uh, and confirm to you that God has called you. God has called you to be a powerful vessel of God, to be used by Him so mightily in His anointing. And it doesn't matter what anybody says or anybody thinks, only what God has said. Hallelujah. Before I go on, I just wanna make sure um, it's we're okay on YouTube and Facebook uh, because my streaming software is telling me that it's like not st streaming, but I think it's just lying to me. <laughs> so I just want to make sure. I think we're good. I don't see any complaints on YouTube. Okay, great. So I want to share my story. There's, I, I get this question a lot. How, you know, how did you find your calling to be an apostle? How did that happen? And also, how did you get to where you are now, <laughs> where you are leading a church and ministering weekly uh, across the world and seeing the power of God move and so many people set free? And so I want to share my story with you. I grew up Christian. My, my earliest memory was age four in my parent in my living room in my house with my parents and giving my life to Jesus there, you know, them leading me through a prayer. And from then on, I, I just always remember believing in God and loving God. And I, I always remember God just being such an important part of my life. And I have such amazing parents with pure, humble hearts, childlike hearts. And um, they, they, always brought me to church. Church was so important. My mom w has always been the, has been the choir director for a long time. Both of my parents always sing in the church choir. I started singing in the church choir at seventh grade. We hardly ever missed a Sunday. Um, so that was my life. I grew up Christian, loving God, believing in God. And, but then when I reached high school, um, I went to a public high school and I started to be a, a lukewarm Christian and had a foot in the world. And the reason was, was because I had yet to encounter God in power, which when I met God in power, I realized that was when I really met Jesus or actually encountered him and I fell in love with him. 
And that's what's necessary to be able to surrender to God. So before that happened, I didn't really understand why you know, we had to follow all of God's commands. I didn't see the seriousness of it at that time. I was missing so much revelation. I was missing so much revelation of God's love. And I didn't yet know really how to have a relationship with God. So it was more religion, I would say, uh, the same prayer every night type thing and at meals and go to church weekly. And so when I turned 18, I remember around that time, I started to meet certain friends who would talk about having a relationship with God and, that, and I started to have a hunger and started to learn, started to seek God more, started to learn how to have a relationship with God. In college, um, I still was in that place of trying to learn how to have a relationship with God. Um, and I was still in that lukewarm place, having one foot in the world and going to church twice a week, uh, every single week during college. Now, when I graduated college, uh, as I graduated, I was, I was asking God, Lord, I just want to be in your will and I don't know what I should do with my life. I didn't know what my purpose was. I didn't know what my calling was. Um, singing and acting was my greatest passion. Uh, but I went to college for something like more practical. But when it came to it, I realized what I went to college for, I wasn't passionate about. And I didn't feel that it was God's calling for my life. So I just was seeking God. What is it, Lord, that I should do? And the singing act and acting was what I was passionate about. So long story short, I felt God clearly uh, speak to me, leading me to move to Los Angeles from upstate New York, where I was from, where I grew up, to Los Angeles to pursue acting. So in 2013, um, I, I right out of college, my first year out of college, 22 years old, I drove out by myself across the country and moved to LA. And once I got in LA, it was amazing. God set a fire in me immediately, a fire like a, a fire to seek Him. A hunger just came in me. And it's amazing looking back because it was just so prophetic. Like it was in LA where I would find my calling and where God had ordained me to be and do great works for Him and where revival would break out. Um, and so it was so prophetic that as soon as I came to LA, I just felt a hunger for God like never before. I was still trying to learn how to have a relationship with God. I was still lukewarm, but that hunger erupted in me. And the Bible says, when you seek me and seek me with all of your heart, then you will find me. And that is then what happened. I started to seek God. I started to seek Him like, like never before. And it was just like every day, every week, a passion for God, a hunger for God grew in me. Um, and, and so my one foot in the world started to slowly come out until one day, a couple years after I first came to LA. At this time, I started to pursue Christian music to be a pop EDM singer songwriter. Um, this happened, long story short, because I was growing closer to God and my desires and dreams started to change where I felt I wanted to do something in ministry. I had no idea it was ministry I was, that my heart was wanting, but I was wanting to do something um, that would be leading people to God and singing songs about God. And so I was then pursuing being a pop Christian EDM singer songwriter I thought for sure this was God's calling for my life. I had been seeking for a long time. Uh, is it this, is it this, is it this? I mean, it, I went from thinking I wanted to um, pursue musical theater to thinking I wanted to be an event planner to thinking I wanted to be a wedding planner to uh, thinking I wanted to sing on a cruise ship to thinking I wanted to be an actor to finally, I thought I had finally found <laughs> my calling, my purpose as a Christian pop EDM singer, songwriter. I put songs out, I put music videos out, and it, there was, it just, 
went so well. Like the production of the videos and the music just, I couldn't imagine it to go so well. The first stuff that I put out, I had never written songs before and like the third song I wrote was the one I put out and reaching out and saying, I'm so proud of you. What you're doing is so amazing. You are going to make it. And I never had this kind of support, applause, acknowledgement in my whole life. And people were just cheering me on like never before. So there was just so much confirmation, right? So in the midst of this, this first year of me pursuing music, thinking I finally found my calling, I encounter God's power for the first time. This hunger that I had led me to seek. This hunger that I had made it so that I had this open heart. Uh, there was a knowing, there was this knowing and hunger I was feeling in me that there must be more. There must be more to God than what I've discovered so far, than what I've experienced so far. And so that hunger led me to uh, seek and seek. And with that seeking, I found God. I found God who moved in power. So I saw, I witnessed people be healed, demons manifest in people, uh, people be delivered. I received prophetic words for the first time in my life. And with prophetic words, it opened up my eyes to God's nearness and love for me. And... I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and um, this happened fast and just encountering God's power just to see Jesus alive in action it opened up my eyes like never before to his to the reality of him like how real he is how near he is and his amazing love and his majesty, the, his almightiness, uh, the fear of God came upon me like never before. And so very soon, very soon after I encountered God's power, my eyes opened up, I surrendered to God everything and I had been wanting to do that for a while, but I was stuck. I had really been wanting to surrender everything and I was stuck. I had, I had been wanting to be on fire for God and I was stuck. I, I didn't know what was wrong, why I was so stuck and why I couldn't do it. And then as soon as my eyes opened up with these encounters with the power of God, it became the easiest thing in the world to surrender. It became what I wanted, the thing I wanted more than anything in my life, from the depths of my heart, it became the only thing that made sense in the world. Um, so I surrendered and I surrendered, I really meant it. I told God, you can take my dreams, my plans, everything. You know, even if my dreams and my plans that I really think are from you are not, you can have your way and, and replace them with your dreams. I really meant it when I surrendered to God and about nine months after I made that real surrender to God, God answered my prayers with giving me new dreams and having his way. What happened was nine months after I surrendered to God fully, I went to a conference uh, it was called a prophetic healing conference in LA where I live and I came expectant and, and hungry and excited and it was a prophet ministering at that event and through this prophet I saw God move in power like I had never seen before the like previous year before that nine months before that I is when my eyes opened up to God's power and I started seeing God's power move through different people several times I was just looking everywhere and finding, you know? But the way I saw the power of God, the anointing move through this prophet, this servant of God was a whole other level. I was in awe, I was stunned, I was shocked. And as I'm, as I'm just watching this, this ministry, this, uh, I was at the conference, 
God was speaking to me, this is really me. God was showing me the fruits. God was speaking to me. I knew in my spirit this was really the work of God and like I've never seen. And this is a true servant of God. This is a true prophet. And so um, I remember thinking how I, I desired like a word upon my life and what ended up happening as I was there, what ended up happening was this prophet prophesied to me and he prophesied he prophesied that my calling was actually to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and that I was called to reach the nations and that he saw me doing many big shocking miracles in front of many people and upon hearing this word I am absolutely shocked the first thing the first thing, I mean, I don't even know what came first actually in my mind. So many things came through my mind, but one of them was, what about my music? Is there more? I want to hear about my music. Can you prophesy about the music? Because this is something I really wanted. It was really my big dream. And um, the second thing that I that came to my, that was in my mind hearing this was, how can this be? Because when I heard the prophetic word, it's like I knew it was God speaking as if like Moses, when he knew it was God speaking to him through the burning bush, he wasn't like, that's weird. Maybe I'm hallucinating. Maybe I'm going crazy, you know? No, he, he knew it was God speaking, <laughs> even though it was something he didn't want to hear, even though it was wild. That's how it was for me. I, I mean, there was not even a 1% doubt that it was God speaking. I just remember knowing this is God speaking right now. And so immediately I'm like, how can this be? Like, I'm believing this is the true word of God. I know it's a true word of God, but I'm like, how can this be? How can this be? Because what I haven't shared with you yet is that public speaking was my biggest fear and weakness <laughs> where even in college I would have to present in front of about 10 people and I would get so nervous and like go brain dead I couldn't I couldn't think straight um, and this was me this was me I did not ha know how to speak off the cuff I could act I could sing I could have a script and be in front of tons of people in high school I was the lead in my high school musicals for three years and no nerves singing the national anthem, no nerves in front of, you know, a basketball, people watching the basketball game, you know. But when it came to speaking in front of just even a couple people, I mean, I remember even attending Bible studies and, you know, you just go around and say, like, this is my name, this is something about me, and I don't know, you just share or something. And I remember just feeling so nervous, feeling so nervous with eyes on me, like, if, if it wasn't like close friends to me. I felt nervous with eyes on me as I was speaking. That's who I was. So, and then, so that's just public speaking and then it comes to preaching. Preaching is something I felt at the time I had no clue to do. I love listening to preachers, but not one time was I like, how? I mean, one time, not one time was I like, maybe I should be a preacher. Not one time. So, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how preachers got revelation. I didn't know how they could be on fire all the time. I didn't know how they wrote sermons. It amazed me, honestly. <laughs> I never thought one time I could do that or I was supposed to do that. So anyways, these thoughts are going through my mind, okay? All of these thoughts are going through my mind when I hear this prophecy. And then I hear God speak to me like a still small voice to my spirit, remind me of Moses because Moses had a stutter and God called Moses to be a mouthpiece of God and to lead millions of people. And Moses had a stutter and Moses is like, how, how, how will this be possible? I stutter. He was thinking like he got, got the wrong person and God, God said to him, I gave you your mouth. I made your mouth. I will give you words to speak that it would be God working through him. So he just needs to obey. And um, 
that's what happened. God did it. God did the miracles of speaking through him and everything else. And so God spoke that to me in that moment. Like, you're like Moses in this moment, but this is really me calling you to do this. Also, um, in terms of leading, because this, this is what God was calling me to do as well, to lead people, to lead in the body of Christ. And I never saw myself as a leader. In college, I remember we would have group projects and I not one time, even when there was just three of us, not one time would I be the one stepping up and saying like, okay, I'll take charge because that's how group projects work. Like somebody just kind of takes charge. I never was a take a charge type person and I I just didn't see myself as a leader at all. (laughs) So talk about weakness. So I hear this word and then God speaks to me that I'm, that it's like Moses. And because I had surrendered to God, all I wanted was to be in God's perfect will. That's literally my own, was my only desire at that point. And God was so amazing with his timing to not release this prophecy to me until I was ready. Because God doesn't force himself. And so before I surrendered, I wanted to be in God's will, but not like in the depths of my heart, right? So if this prophecy came to me before I surrendered, maybe I would have said yes, but more like reluctantly. But God does not want us to be forced. God wants us to have free will. So God wants us to, um, you know, say yes to God in the hard things, in the uncomfortable things, in the things that we're not excited about doing. But above all, above us not being excited about doing it, We want to please God. We want to be in his will more than all of that. That is supreme. So I look back and I'm amazed at God's perfect timing. So because that day I I said yes to God. I didn't I didn't skip a beat. I didn't because I knew it was God speaking and I had the fear of God and I just wanted to be in his will. So I didn't take a day to think about it. Thank God I didn't converse with a bunch of people because a lot of them would have said, but been used by the enemy because of their lack of revelation and would have discouraged me. So God gave me the wisdom that I had this encounter and that I should not throw my pearls to the swine so that I'm poisoned by words of the enemy of something so pure and filled with confusion and possibly possibly be led astray. So I accepted that very day what God was calling me to be as an apostle. I wasn't that excited about it. It was just that I wanted to please God and be in his will. I was kind of grieving over the music and wondering, will I be able to sing still? But I wasn't, I was not like, woohoo, this is an exciting calling God has given me. I was extremely humbled because I knew what I knew it was something big that was that God was calling me to. And so I was extremely hum- humbled and I had the fear of God and I felt so much like, why me? Why me? But I, so there were so many, but I just trusted God. I trusted that, I trusted that, I remember from day one, I trusted that he would give me a heart for what he had called me to, because I did not have a heart to preach, a heart to pray for people. I mean, my biggest passion, once my eyes opened up to God moving in power, my biggest passion above singing became to see others encounter God's power. That was one of the confirmations that God was calling me to, that, that God was really calling me to be an apostle. That was truly my biggest passion was to see others encounter God's power, but it was not a passion for me to be the vessel. It was just my passion for people to encounter God's power. So my passion at that time was like to share testimonies and to um, tell other people or tell people, go to this minister, go to this minister so you can encounter what I've encountered. That was my passion, not being the minister. (laughs) Um, And I hadn't seen many ministers operate in God's power, so I didn't even think that that was like a possibility. I thought it was just like for the very rare elite, and I thought that those rare elite people 
would be much more uh, spiritual than me. Like I considered, I didn't consider myself this amazing Christian. I knew that my heart was pure. I knew that, you know, like I, I knew I would see, you know, differences maybe in other people and understand, okay, that there's purity there, that some others don't don't have purity or and, and, and humility. But I had insecurities. I, I felt like I didn't read the Bible enough. I felt like I didn't hear from God um, that much. You know, I heard other people talking about how they got this revelation and this revelation and had this vision and this, God told me this, God told me this. And I wasn't having that, you know, I didn't feel confident in like, yes, I hear from God so well. So when it came to like seeing myself as this like extraordinary Christian, I didn't see myself that way at all. I saw myself as very normal, like averagey Job Christian who has a lot of work to do. You know, that's how I saw myself. So, um, yeah, I, what, I, what I did know, though, is that what I, what I believed from day one, what made it, what made it um, easy for me to surrender to God and accept this call was that I knew God was so good and He would never call me to something that He wouldn't give me a heart for. Because imagine how, like, maybe, like, crazy that is that my passion, my dreams, what I'm talented at and gifted at and what I've worked at for years is singing. And I'm not passionate and I feel I'm not gifted at all at ministering, at preaching. That's kind of a hard pill to swallow, right? To drop what you're passionate about and what you've worked hard at. And, and, and grab something that you don't feel like you're good at, you're starting from square one and you don't have a passion for. You know, I, I was ready. I was, I mean, at this point, I was age 25. This happened um, in 2016 in September is when this happened, when I received this prophecy. Um, and so I was 25. I had gone to college for four years for communications. I... So that was 2013. So for uh, a few years from there, I had been living such a frugal life, um, like sharing a room with another person in a two-bedroom apartment, the three of us living there, you know, just living in a, like a poor life. <laughs> and I was like ready to get on with life now. And you know, God, now God wants me to start from like square one. <laughs> So that was a hard pill to swallow, but I just wanted to be in God's will. I just wanted to be in God's will. That was it. And I knew this is what made it easy for me to surrender. I knew that God was so good that he would never call me to something that he wouldn't give me a heart for. I knew he would give me a passion. I knew he would, he would give me a heart to minister to people, that I would be passionate about it. I trusted him in this. I didn't see how it was going to be possible, but I just trusted him. I trusted that he can do anything, so he can change my heart. He can give me new passions. He can give me new dreams. So I surrendered. And I want to tell you right now, I want to follow up with that by telling you that God has indeed been so faithful. Okay, that was, it'll be seven years, right? Is, am I doing the math right? Seven years this September, it will be since receiving that calling and saying yes to God. And not only has God, just like he did with Moses, given me words to speak that I didn't have, that he supernaturally gave me words. Not only did he equip me and give me giftings, spiritual giftings, all kinds of giftings and everything I would need and knowledge and wisdom to do what he was calling me to do as a minister. He gave me that. Not only that, but he gave me a heart, a new heart. He gave me new passions, new dreams, new desires that were his, that were his. He put them in me. And so now I have new eyes. I have new eyes for his people. I have new love for his people. Now I can tell you that ministering 
preaching, praying for people is my biggest passion. The passion I have to minister now is far greater than my passion was seven years ago for singing. So much greater. And I praise God that He is in control of my life, that He's the leader of my life, the master of my life. Because if I had gone with my dreams, and not God's dreams, but my dreams and my plans, I would not be experiencing the immense joy and fulfillment and contentment that I am experiencing now living in his dream that I originally didn't want. <laughs> he is so good, he is so faithful. And I wanna encourage you that there's so much more that God has out there for you on the other side of surrender. There's ways that he's gonna bring you joy, contentment, fulfillment, abundant life that's on the other side of your surrender. How it works with God is you, you obey Him without the feelings, before you have the feelings. You obey Him and then as, as you obey, God comes in and molds your heart, transforms your heart. That's how you're transformed into the image of God, into His likeness, to have His heart qualities, His character, to be like Him, to think like Him, sound like Him, speak like him, look like him, be like him. It's by you doing what he says to do. Obeying him in his word of God, in the word, the written word, logos, and in the rhema word, the spoken word of God. Like for me, receiving this prophecy was a spoken word, a rhema word. And so you obey him in these commands and you don't feel like doing the commands many times, but you obey him and then once you obey him, it's you give him then permission to put his hands upon your heart, upon all of you, and transform you, transform your soul. Do supernatural things to you. So he molds you into being like him. And so I got to experience that with my heart, with my heart, with my passions. I got to experience him changing my heart by obeying him. So when I started to obey him, before I got there, about um, almost, it was, so seven years ago I received this, this prophecy over my life, and I immediately said yes. And then um, about not, uh, nine months to the day later, I started Fivefold Church. In addition to being an apostle, God also called me to start Fivefold Church, a church. And um, apostles, they are pioneers, they, are, they plant churches. This is one of the, the big, big characteristics of an apostle. So God called me to start Fivefold Church and that is where I started ministering for the first time. So my, the person who prophesied over me, God spoke to me, God revealed to me that this is who he had called to be my spiritual father. So he, to this day, is my spiritual father. And as God used him as a vessel, that, that was one of the major ways that God uh, guided me, taught me, helped me to grow in wisdom, opened my spiritual eyes, learned spiritual things. So much of that was through the vessel of my spiritual father. God uses vessels and I'm so grateful for my spiritual father. I'm so grateful God used him and still uses him to this day. And I am so grateful and so humbled and honored to be his spiritual daughter. He's I've, the most amazing vessel of God that I've, that I've seen. Um, his, first of all, I've never seen a heart like his, a heart that's like Jesus's, a heart of humility, a heart of purity, a heart of childlikeness, a heart of selflessness, a heart of generosity and all of these qualities of Jesus in him has really helped me develop those qualities like I've become so much more humble and pure and childlike and generous and selfless and also a hard worker for God that's another one um, so largely by his example, you know, Paul, Paul, he says to his spiritual children, he says, 
Paul actually teaches us about spiritual fathers and mothers. Um, he says, you have many teachers, he says to his disciples, but you only have one father. I became your father in the Lord, he says. So he's speaking of spiritual father. So um, Paul also says, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So this is just one of the big ways that God helps us to be molded into the image of God is to have an example, to see what humility looks like in a person, to see what purity looks like in a person, to see what being generous looks like in a person, to see what being selfless looks like in a person, to see what hard work looks like in a person. This is one of the big ways God molds us is for us to see, look, learn, and know it's possible. You know, it's so many of us, we are stopped short of being transformed into God's image because we don't think such things are possible. We think we're doing good enough in some areas and God wants us to go further and it's possible. But we got to see that example to have our faith lifted and see it's possible and be inspired to deny our, crucify our flesh more and surrender to God more and obey him deeper. Amen. So I started Fivefold Church nine months later and that was the first time I ministered. Um, we started on a mountaintop in LA on Mulholland Drive overlooking Los Angeles. And it started by me with a guitar. I had just taught myself a few chords. I went to Guitar Center and purchased, got a credit card because I didn't have much money at the time. So I purchased um, a music stand, a microphone, a battery operated um, speaker, and I made a homemade sign that said worship night. <laughs> made a homemade sign on foam board and gold stickers from Target. And I set it up on the mountaintop in a little patchy grass area in an overlook spot on Mulholland Drive overlooking the valley in Los Angeles. And I just worked really hard like posting on Facebook groups, L LA Christian Facebook groups saying, hey, there's a worship night, join us. And so we would see people trickle in uh, from, we would have two to 12 people tops probably come from hearing about it on the Facebook groups. And um, when I first started to preach, it was the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done. You know, I've gone skydiving twice, had supernaturally no fear. I went on a cruise ship around the whole world on semester at sea, it was a study abroad program. We circumnavigated the whole world, went to 13 countries. I didn't know anybody on the ship, but I went, no fear. Um, I drove across the, the country by myself, no fear. You know, I had this natural courage in me since a kid, but except for when it came to speaking in front of people, that was my big fear. <laughs> so this was the most uncomfortable thing, far more uncomfortable than skydiving and all these things was getting up in front of a couple people and preaching for the first time. <laughs> I felt so inadequate. I felt like not a preacher. I felt like, are these people even going to be blessed? You know, and that's how I felt. And, um, but I just, I just knew God was calling me to do this. And so I just knew I had to obey. It was very simple. It was just like, huh, God has called me to do this. Okay, I have to do this. That's it. <laughs> so I just showed up and I just showed up week after week, week after week and preached week after week. And it was uncomfortable week after week, week after week. I would hear the devil speaking to me in my head. Um, You're not a good preacher. The people aren't blessed. Um, just those lies, I would hear them like every week. And I did not feel confident in myself every week. But I believed God more than I believed my feelings. I believed God's word, what he called me to do more than I believed my feelings and what was going on in my head. I believe that was the truth. And so I showed up and I preached boldly while feeling inadequate, not good enough and nervous. I preached, I declared the word and God taught me through this, that this is what real confidence is. 
Real confidence is not feeling confident. Many times we think, yeah, that person's really confident because they, they just feel, they feel confident doing this. I do not feel confident, but true confidence is pushing past the lies of the enemy and your feelings and just doing what God has called you to do despite how you feel, just doing it. And when you are strong in faith in that way, God will come through and people won't even think, people won't even know you're nervous and all that's going on the inside because all that's going on the inside isn't truth. It's all lies. It's all lies of the devil. So if you can just keep going despite how you're feeling and the, what you're thinking and just do it anyway, even though it's uncomfortable, the peop, the, it, what's seen is you're confident and you are confident, right? So uh, that really helped me having that revelation and realizing God has called me to do this, so that's it. It doesn't matter how I feel. I just got to keep going. <laughs> So then we had, um, we moved into a church building a few months later. And so 2017 is when I started the church outside. That fall we went into a building. And for four and a half years from the beginning of church, for four and a half years, I'm just going to share about that season of four and a half years, we were in a building for a lot of the time, a couple different buildings. And we had between two and 20 people that would come to the church. And the first year we had about 20 people. The second year we had about 15. The, the next year we had about 10. And the fourth year we had about five. And then COVID hit and then we had about two. Chantal and I, Chantal who does so much in the church, she's a worship leader and does so many other things and travels with me uh, to minister as I minister. But um, through that Year, through that season of four and a half years, God took me through the refining fire. God took me through the wilderness. God allowed the devil to test and try me. God does this. He, Job went to heaven and asked God, I want to test and try your servant. And God says, okay, you can. You know, the devil says he's just, I think he's just, um, just praises you and loves you because you've blessed him so much. So I wanna test that and see if when blessings are taken away, if he'll still praise you and love you. And God says, okay, I gave you permission. <laughs> you know, I mean, God is the, the master, the king of the whole world. So you gotta understand that a lot of things, they're happening because God allowed it. <laughs> but he's, he's nothing but good. So if he allowed something, it, it has a purpose. It's for your good. And so God allowed, he allowed a lot of spiritual attacks to come my way to refine me. Um, I just saw a lot of the Bible come alive in terms of spiritual attack. Like I never encountered, um, I never encountered hatred, jealousy, backstabbing, false accusations, lies made up out of thin air and being spread around evil like this kind of evil stuff especially from Christians I never saw that or encountered that in my whole life it was a rude awakening um, my naivety went away <laughs> in that season but I went through a lot of that I went through a lot of that and um, you know that's the kind of training that children of God go through that's the kind of training to have the heart refined for in so many areas the heart refined to have a strong faith that no matter what's happening no matter what comes your way no matter the lies of the devil that are so strong the persecution the accused false accusations no matter what your faith remains and you know that even when it doesn't seem like there's a way out god will make a way um, what has to be refined in that heart that God does through this season is to take away the fear of man because that's going to naturally be there until you're tried and tested and refined. It's a natural instinct for humans to um, to want people to like them and approve of them. It's a natural human instinct for if someone doesn't like them for no reason, hates them for no reason, uh, is saying trash about them, 
uh, false accusations about them, it's natural for that to deeply hurt, really bother, offend a person. <laughs> and so that's why God allows this kind of specific attack when you have a big calling on your life, slinging at you, you know who you are in Christ and you, all you care about is what God thinks of you and you are grateful for the refining that's happening because you just want to be more like God and you just want the purpose of your life to be fulfilled and you know that's necessary. God's going to God has to bring you there, and that's how he brings you there through these tests. This is what Joseph had to go through as his brothers were jealous and threw him in the pit. Then there was false accusations thrown at him by that the woman, the wife of his boss, and he was then thrown into prison. You know, Jesus had so many false accusations thrown at him um, the, 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 and persecution and so much hate, the, the so much saying you're false thrown at him. The disciples had to go through the same thing when they were, in, but I grew closer to God like never before in those seasons. And I got to know, I got to find out what the secret place really was, the secret place of obeying God when no one else sees. You know, God sees all of the hate all of the mistreatment thrown at you, all of the nasty words thrown at you that you don't deserve, he sees it. And a lot of people don't see it. And you only you even see it to the extent only God knows what you're going through. And only God knows your innocence, complete, your complete innocence, only if that's the case. Only God knows your complete purity if that's the case. No one can know the depths of a person's heart. You know, only God can know how how like hard it is what you're going through. Only God. People can guess. People can think, oh, that's hard. But, but only God knows. Only God sees those tears in, at, at night, you know, in your room. And only God sees that, that obedience in, in, in so many little areas, that obedience of not d being eye for eye, not doing something mean back, uh, keeping your mouth shut. Only God sees it to that extent. Only God sees when you are obeying him in these tasks that he's asking you to do, um, serving him again and again and again when there's no progress, it seems, when it feels like there's no fruit. Um, at five in the morning, I remember just still editing videos when it was getting hardly any views. And I just remember feeling so close to God, just just sensing him looking at me, you know, it was just alone in my room and just sensing him looking at me and just being proud of me. Just being like, thank you, my daughter. I, I see you and I'm proud of you. <laughs> I know this is hard and you're touching my heart. The fact that it's hard, it touches my heart more. You know, it touches God's heart so much whenever we surrender and obey him. But when it's hard, when it's hard, it touches his heart even more. It touches his heart even more. And so that's how I found strength and joy. That's how I found strength and peace and joy and intimacy with God like never before through these seasons is that when I'm surrendering to God and obeying him when it was so hard, I, I, I could feel him being proud of me. You know, I could feel that I was touching his heart in a deeper level and so it made there to be like joy and peace and contentment in those really hard times because when you're surrendered to God, all you want to do is be in his will and touch his heart. Like that's your biggest desire. You have other desires, but nothing trumps that desire. And so when it feels like the world's falling apart and you're in this big storm, but but even though it feels like the world's falling apart and in, your this, in this storm, you're touching God's heart and you're in his will, then that means that your one desire is fulfilled. So that's the, that's the greatest thing. I mean, that's, that's greater than, than being in perfect circumstances, perfect life conditions, having a family, love, 
a big house, a nice car, a lot of money in the bank, an amazing career, your dreams fulfilled, but not being in God's will and not touching his heart. That is hell. <laughs> Whereas crazy storms are happening circumstantially, the world it feels like the world's caving in on you, but you're in God's will and you're touching his heart. That's heaven. That's peace and joy you find there in contentment. So, um, by the way, for about, I don't know, I would say a good three years or so as I'm ministering, when I'm preaching, we were getting smaller each year. And I was growing in confidence a little bit of preaching, but not a lot. I was still battling the devil's lies for years, saying I was not a good enough preacher, saying this is why people aren't coming back. This is why people aren't coming back. Why we're getting smaller is because you're not a good enough preacher. I would, it would be very hard for me to even see other preachers online because every time I saw another preacher online, I would be enamored and amazed by how they would preach and the revelation they had and how they would speak. And I would be like, I am nothing like this. I can't compare to this. I would feel that so strongly. I would hear the devil speaking that for a good probably at least three to almost four years of just showing up every week and preaching and seeing the church get smaller. So um, the bigger the calling, the bigger the price, the bigger the anointing, the bigger the price you have to pay, the bigger the uh, a calling, the, the bigger the preparation, the higher the building, the bigger and the bigger the foundation has to be. God spoke that truth to me. God spoke that truth to me when I was going through this. I remember where I lived, there was, I saw a whole big apartment complex being built from the ground up. It's the first time I'd ever, you know, driven by something and seen it gr go from a hole in the ground to then a foundation to the walls to complete. I got to see that in my own eyes and it was so beautiful because God was literally showing me and reminding me because that was through the wilderness season. And it took a long time. It took, I don't know how, I don't remember how long it took. It took at least a year, probably more than that. But it was a huge apartment building and I would drive by every day and God would remind me every day, it takes time. What I've called you to is big, it's gonna take time. Be okay with it, be at peace, don't be anxious. This is just what we gotta go through, it's okay. I'm with you, it's gonna be worth it. And um, you know, I remember seeing that building being completed, that apartment being completed and it was shortly, and I, and I felt like it was prophetic. I felt like it was prophetic and shortly after is when I started to see the promises fulfilled. Is when I started to see that wilderness, come, it was time to come out of the wilderness season in my life. So this is what happened. Um, about three years in, into ministering, uh, or I'm sorry, no, um, I meant for three years. So for, basically it was like a year and a half into leading the church. Um, so about maybe four-ish years ago from now, but um, four or five, about a year into leading the church, God spoke to me that it was actually, I received a prophetic word from my spiritual father that he's like, I see this revival breaking out, but how it's going to happen is through one minute videos. One minute videos is going to make the revival to break out because my spiritual father had also released a prophetic word for America and the whole world. He had released this prophetic word that, um, he actually came all the way from Tanzania and, and announced this word and said, he was ministering at a conference and he said, God sent me all the way from Tanzania to, to, to speak this word for America and beyond. That God has heard your prayers for revival for so many years, for generations, and he is answering them now. God is pouring out apostles and prophets and revival has come now. And God, and God is bringing the revival through the apostolic and through the prophetic ministries. And nothing, I repeat, nothing he prophesied can stop this move of God. That was prophetic because the devil does not want it to happen. The devil would try to stop it, still tries to stop it, but nothing, I repeat, nothing will be able to stop this move of God, this revival. Hallelujah. So um, I started, I didn't know how to edit videos, but, um, you know, God said to Moses, what's in your hand? 
when Moses was like, how will they know that you are with me, God? How will the people know that you're calling me to prophesy to, lead everything, um, and speak up to Pharaoh? And, and God says, what's in your hand? It was a staff, a regular staff, you know, just a normal regular staff to shepherd. And God says, throw on the ground. And when he threw it on the ground, it turned into a snake. It turned into a snake. And um, that was a sign. Like God was showing him, look, I'll do a sign through what's, what's in your hand when you actually use what's in your hand. So God like spoke to me, you know, you can't just wait around and pray. Pray and wait around for video editors to come, for all these people to come that have all these skills. I've given you a brain. I've given you a uh, Google. <laughs> no, I've given you, um, I've given you a computer. You know that that has. I've given you resources. You can Google things. You can teach yourself. You can research. You can, you can do more than you think you can. But you have to be disciplined. You have to go to work. You can't be lazy. You have to try. You have to get uncomfortable. You know, step out of the box. So, I taught myself how to edit. Okay, um, so I taught myself how to edit and I began to edit videos because this is what God had spoke, that I must put out these videos. So I put out these one minute videos and they would get hardly any views for years. So it was about three years of putting out these videos on all platforms, well, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at the time, and getting hardly any views, likes, nothing. Not growing. I had really a very, very small following, not really a following. And then, I, but I just kept going every week. I would spend so many hours editing, posting. I went to um, Mexico on vacation for a few days with Chantal for my 30th birthday. And the day before flying there, I was in the shower and I got this vision, this idea from God of a one, of a one minute video that took, um, uh, that was showing God moving in power the past year. Side note, about nine months or so into first starting the church is when I first started to see God's power move through me. I remember going to, I went to my visit my spiritual father's church. I received an invitation when I was there and I was so expectant and hungry to see the power of God move in our church. I hadn't seen it at all yet at that point. I hadn't seen any kind of manifestations of God's power. It was just walking in faith. And um, I was not, I never felt prophetic. I never, <laughs> I never felt prophetic at all. I was just believing, trusting God. Somehow this is going to happen. <laughs> so you're going to give me the ability to see in the spiritual realm and prophesy. And miracles would somehow happen. I just was believing, trusting God and not seeing it. So I come back from receiving invitation. I'm so hungry. I felt so different on the plane. I was reading the Bible and getting all this revelation on the plane like never before, praying and reading the Bible on the, on the whole 25 hour plane ride. I mean, I was on fire like never before. I knew I was different. Show up to church that, week, that Sunday. After I preach, I call people forward and I place my hand on, on a woman's hand. She was actually Chantal's mom before she brought Chantal. She invited Chantal, Chantal came two weeks later. But I put my hand on this woman's hand, on her mom's hand, and she fell back with the power of God. That was the first time I saw God move through me in power. After that, I began to pray for people and the prophetic anointing came upon me for the first time. Like I just started having this knowing and I started just saying words to people, praying, words coming out and they're weeping. That was the first time I saw the prophetic anointing uh, flow through me. And um, from there, every week, most, most weeks, we would, see, we, would see, we would see God move in power here and there. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, sometimes people would fall back with God's power. Um, and the prophetic, the prophetic ministry and people being really touched by the prophetic word. But we got smaller and smaller and smaller. So it wasn't re looking like revival and it wasn't like big miracles everywhere by any means. It would be a new person coming, I would pray for them, they would cry being touched by Jesus, the prophetic ministry, and usually they wouldn't come back, we wouldn't see them again, and then a couple of months later maybe a new person would come and the same thing would happen. So that was it. So we were grateful, I was so grateful God was moving in power, but was so believing for so much more. It was not seeing any kind of deliverances or much healing at all. Um, so 
fast forward back to this vision in the shower I have. Um, I have this vision, this, this idea just came to me and I instantly got so excited about it. It was just, I knew it was from God. Just showing God moving in power that past year, the, the moments that were captured. And I put it on a 59 second video on TikTok. At the end of the video, I prayed simply for people. Just simple declaration of healing uh, and depression, and anxiety to go, stuff like that. And I, I worked hard the first night on vacation. I was working hard into the night, putting this video together, working hard on the plane. And I released the video, I woke up the next morning and it went viral. And by my birthday, 30th birthday, January 1st, a day and a half later, I had 1 million views. But the even more shocking uh, and amazing thing is that there were thousands of comments on the video testifying of miracles people received while watching the video. So many people were testifying of feeling things leave them and then feeling peace, like feeling something lift off of them. So many people testified of pain leaving their bodies. Others saying they had COVID symptoms, but then they watched it and then it left. This was um, January 2021, January 1st, 2021. Uh, well, December 31st, 2020 is when it went viral. So 2020 was technically, I guess, the best year, <laughs> if you want to count it by that day, <laughs> for me. Um, but so anyways, I was shocked beyond belief. This was like the promise fulfilled. I, I mean, for years, I was believing in revival to break out. For years, I was believing in these promises of God for four and a half years. And then in one moment, everything changed. And it, I'll never forget that day for the rest of my life. I wanted to jump on the rooftops and shout that God is faithful. The revelation of God's faithfulness was on a whole other level that I never experienced before because I never believed in a promise for four and a half years before and it looked like I was going farther and farther away but then seeing it happen and it being beyond how I would think it would happen you know um, and so then I wouldn't go I would go I started going live twice I got a following on TikTok fast a big following fast because of that video I started going live twice a week every week and um, so many so many miracles were happening on every live. It was shocking. It was like God has just decided to move. Like in terms of my journey, my purpose of my life, like it was kind of like God just had me like hidden and was just preparing me. And God didn't see I was ready yet. You know, it wasn't his timing yet for this part of my purpose to be fulfilled. You know, for this, for miracles to be happening all the time and many people coming and receiving like it just wasn't time before his timing's perfect and there's different seasons and so many times we want the promise tomorrow but we can't handle the promise tomorrow we'll lose it it'll be a disaster and we need to trust God that his timing is perfect he knows what he's doing he knows all the molding that has to happen in our hearts. He knows the perfect preparation in the spiritual realm that has to take place. So we should never be impatient. We should remind ourselves, renew our minds with this, that we only want God's timing, God's, God's will, wanting God's will, like desiring, God, I want your will, that includes wanting God's timing. So we really have to remember that every time we feel like complaining or being impatient, um, and, and being in this place of desperation to the point where we're not content because we want something so bad, we have to renew our minds that God, God's in control. And if it's not happening yet, then it just means that it's not his timing yet. You're in his will and that's all that matters. And it, the promise will be fulfilled in his perfect timing. So um, it was like revival broke out so fast from there every week. It was online revival. I mean, so many people in the comments, I was healed of this, I was delivered of this, this just happened. Da, 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 da. I just remember just like, I remember Jean-Tel would screenshot the comments and I would just be in awe every day, like looking at so many comments of testimonies happened. This happened like overnight. It, I had never seen God do a miracle through any of my videos except one, two months prior, just one. And now it's uncountable. And I was going live every single day during the COVID season, every single day. And I would see the Instagram live go from one person to zero. I would watch that on several occasions. 
and and so God blew my mind. Then we were we, we moved church outside in the park in 2020, and um, we moved out. We moved. God said, "I'm moving my I'm moving outside of the box. Take my church outside." So we went and started having services in the park July 31st of 2020, and we would have services there one to two times a week. And there was just two, uh, just a handful of us. It was Jean-Tal and I, Jean-Tal's mom and Fred many times is how it would, has how it was many times. And then more and more would come, more and more people would start coming. And, and then we, we got to um, 20 once in a while, we would then be at like three the next week. <laughs> and so this is how it was for months until January 1st, or when that video reached 1 million views. And then there was this slow kind of trickling in of people coming, finding out from online, from the TikTok and from other places online. March, we grew to 30 people, about 30 people, 20 to 30 people. And in March, there was a woman who wrote to me and she said, I'm coming to your church service in the park from Massachusetts. I saw your video on Instagram and I saw Jesus in your eyes. That was what she said. So it's like God pulled her to come and encounter him at our service in the park, revival in the park. Um, and so she brought her friend in that same Sunday. And this was exactly two years ago. Next week it would be March 20, 21st. Um, she, uh, the same Sunday, there was a person that came from Nashville, and she brought someone too. And so I remember going, driving to the park that day, being more expectant than ever before in my life. I was like, I remember talking to God like, Lord, you're bringing four people on a plane to come, come to our church service in the park of just like 20 to 30 people. Wow, Lord, I just feeling so humbled and so expectant because I knew the principle of hunger, that if they were that hungry, that God was going to show up like never before. And God did, and he exceeded my expectations a million times over. What happened was I started ministering after so much spiritual warfare where there was people in our amphitheater, 60 people having an event in our amphitheater space. And we had to, I had to just plead with them, please, if you could move, since your event's pretty much over, now you're just socializing, if you could just move over to the grass. <laughs> because we have people flying in to come to the the group was socializing, blasting heavy metal music six feet away, about six feet away from where I was ministering. So I just got on the mic and preached really loud, like the loudest in my life, because the heavy metal music was blasting. And I didn't want the people to miss out from receiving. I had them sit in the very front row, and I just stood one foot in front of them, <laughs> screaming and <laughs> yelling in the mic. And um, after I preached, I called that woman up from Massachusetts, and I prayed for her just as like I would always pray for people for years at this point, but this time she fell back with God's power. And when she was on the ground, she started convulsing. And I recognized immediately that it was demons manifesting in her. And I had seen this in my spiritual father's ministry and in other ministries, but I had never seen this in my ministry or when I prayed for somebody. But God was so good. He just led me to minister, to walk in authority and boldness and be firm and walk in dominion and use the authority he's given me. And I commanded that demon to leave her and it left her. It came out of her as she was standing with such force that she fell down to the ground. It looked like someone had pushed her. And it was so supernatural. And she, her head landed on a gentleman's who was going to the church his foot and she just immediately was like like asleep and that's like the bible coming alive there's an instance where someone was delivered by a demon they thought he was dead but he was just sleeping <laughs> and um i was shocked i will never forget that day i was so in awe of jesus i was so in awe and i put a video of her deliverance online that went viral um so fast and then more and more people started coming from that video. And then it began to be people coming hungry for deliverance, for freedom. And so demons were now manifesting, usually most every Sunday service, and demons were being cast out every single Sunday service, more than one. And then I would post more videos of the deliverances, and those were going viral, so viral, um, mostly on TikTok is where they're going viral. 
and um, at first, and then all Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, then would go viral too. But so March twenty first is when that demon was cast out. We grew to about eighty people in May twenty something, whatever twenty fourth, whatever that Sunday was. So in two months, we grew from. 25 ish 30 to 80 I'll dream about that I had dreamed about where so many miracles happened where demons were manifesting everywhere and demons were being cast out everywhere and people were jumping up in hour of deliverance I think it says one, or one hour of mir- one hour of constant miracles one hour of constant miracles so revival broke out one hour of constant miracles that's what it's called I, I think it has several hundred thousand views or something now but um, I mean, I'll never forget that day. You just look around and I think most people there had never seen God move like that before. I had never seen God move like that before. Maybe everybody had never seen God move like that before. It was the promise fulfilled. And from that day, almost two years ago, every single week people have flown across the country and now other nations to come to Fivefold Church and encounter Jesus who comes in power to deliver and heal and do miracles. There has never been a week where someone hasn't gotten on a plane to come since that day two years ago, which is so shocking. It's really revival. So um, ever since that day, hundreds have come. Ever since that day, so many miracles have taken place. It's been mass deliverance every single week at Fivefold Church since then. Of the anointing and the revival fire to carry back to Pakistan because their heart burns for the so many people who are in bondage and they don't see the anointing moving in Pakistan. They came with their young children to receive impartation all the way to the US. Um, a, a week, another week we had, another recent week we had a whole family from the Netherlands, another family from Australia, another person from Australia, another person from um, the UK and um, another person from Mexico all in one Sunday and then two Sundays ago I believe it was we had two different people from Hong Kong and other na- other nations so many different nations have come Europe Asia Australia Canada of course uh, South America Africa and it's hearing the testimonies of how people's lives have been completely changed. This past Sunday, this woman shared a testimony that made us all just stand to our feet and jump up and scream to God, shout to God, and left in tears and speechless. I was speechless. Medicines just to go to sleep. Being involved with a lot of witchcraft that led to all this bondage to yesterday testifying that she is free from all of the hundreds of medications completely. She doesn't take any of them. And she came with a huge box with, it looked like at least 100 medications in that box. And I asked her if that was all, and she said that's all that would fit in the box. It was even more. She doesn't take anything to go to sleep anymore. She sleeps peacefully now. She's free completely, and she was just weeping in awe of God. (laughs) In awe of God. There was another woman yesterday who testified of um, being diagnosed with schizophrenia, depression, and many other things and she would sleep in until 2 p.m. and because she was so depressed God delivered her just this past month she started watching these lives here God delivered her and now she's getting up in the morning she's going to the gym and she's coming out of depression completely praise God praise God Um, in August of July, about July, August of uh, 2021, a few months after that revival broke out in the park, there was just this great hunger around the U.S. for people to, people desiring to see revival in their cities, people hungering to see what they were watching online, what was going viral, what they were seeing in the park in L.A., a five church, to see it in their cities. And so all of a sudden, my, the, our ministry email was just flooded with emails of people just asking if I could come minister. And it ranged from ministers to just normal people just hungry for revival in their in their town. And, and I said yes to wherever God was calling me to say yes to. Many were pastors and ministers with churches. Many were normal people who would just hold the service in a park or a different kind of venue and just put the event on themselves. 
and I started ministering every single week, every single week from August 2021, every single week until um, January of 2023, I ministered every single week besides like three or four weeks total over a year and a half. And I'm still ministering most weeks, but the first month and a half, two months of 2023, God had me uh, stay home in LA more for this new season of moving into our building and bringing in the harvest that God wanted to bring in a new harvest at Fivefold Church. But I still minister almost every week. I ministered last week in Columbia, South Carolina, where God moved powerfully and people traveled from 13 states and even Norway and Alaska and Costa Rica and Puerto Rico just to come encounter Jesus and be free. And so many were free and I ministered I minister uh, in Maryland on fri this Friday. I minister in Honolulu, Hawaii for two days the next week. And two weeks from there, I minister in Prague. We have more events coming up as well that we'll announce soon. Cape Town, South Africa and Pretoria, South Africa is in May, around mid-May time. Um, and for all of those events, for those details, you can go to 5fchurch.org. And, and you'll find the revival itinerary or go to the link in my bio for Instagram for all the details for the events. But um, we, I mean, so many events, we just see people showing up at 7 a.m. for a 7 p.m. event, so hungry. Huge lines out the door, just so hungry and, and not wanting to miss anything, wanting to be there in the front, like just with such hunger. We've seen revival break out every single time. So many people be delivered, healed, receive invitation, encounter God's power at all of these events. In January 2022, I went to my first nation outside of the U.S. to minister. And it ended up being 10 different nations I ministered at in 2022 uh, and 12 international trips. And we saw even 3,000 people gather in Johannesburg, South Africa in November. <laughs> it was so powerful how God moved among those hungry, hungry people. And many events in Europe, we've seen people from 25, 26, 27 nations around there, 20, like the high 20s, I think it was, different nations traveling to gather in London, UK, in Germany, for example, to encounter Jesus. And so I give glory to God, all the glory to God for every single part of my journey that I just shared and every single miracle that he's done. And I want to share my story with you today um, to encourage you that nothing is impossible with God and that God really wants to use you. Do not disqualify yourself because of how you look, because of the lack of gifts you think you have because of the lack of experience you have because of other words people have said to you um, don't disqualify yourself from that from how you feel and the, the lies of the devil in your head don't disqualify yourself god is the only one who really qualifies nothing else it is god alone and god is going to qualify you god wants to use you in his anointing god wants to do such powerful things through your life. And you have to push aside insecurities. You have to push aside the devil's voice. You need to realize that the devil does, is so terrified of what God has in store for your life. The devil is so terrified of your calling. He's so terrified for you to see who you are in Christ. He's so terrified for you to say yes to God and be, be confident in God's faithfulness be confident in God's faithfulness for him to equip you and be with you. God, the devil is terrified of that. So now is the time right now. Now is the time where God is using the weak and foolish things. Now is the time where God is using the unexpected ones. God is looking for pure and humble hearts. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for resumes. He's not looking for validation from people. He's not looking for people who are connected, who have the connections. He's not looking for people's approval. He's not looking for leaders, for ministers' approval of you. He's not looking for what people want, what people want in a vessel of God. God is looking at one thing, 
your heart, the purity of your heart. It doesn't matter the abilities you don't think you have. God will do supernatural things like he did in me and he did in Moses, give you words to speak, give you ability, ignite the spiritual gifts in you. He will do the impossible in your life if you will just say yes. You have to say yes, Lord, I'll use, I'll use me in any way that you want. I am yours. And when you do, you give God permission to do big, giant things that you could never conceive or imagine for your life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, so that's my story. I wanted to share more, but I see it's time is really running. I wanted to share more about um, how God is calling even women to preach and pastor and be in ministry and how God YouTube and Facebook. I will link those big explanations, but um, really quickly in Ephesians 4.11, it says Christ gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his body for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So God gave the whole, all those offices of ministry for the purpose of equipping the bodies so that the body of Christ would be mature and would be strong, mature, equipped vessels of God themselves. And it says that in verse 13, that until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, being fully mature. So that means, what is that, what that is saying is that the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers will be equipping the body until we come to the measure of the fullness of Christ, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That can't be until Jesus returns. So this scripture says very clearly that Apostles and prophets need to be there with evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the body. This is going to continue. We can't knock them out or we will not be fully equipped. So we need to stand on the word of God, not current Christian culture, not wrong revelation from the word of God, and not what other people say, but we need to stand on the word of God. I, I didn't ever want to call myself an apostle, but this was just obedience to God. I remember when I, when I felt God wanted me to change my handle to Apostle Catherine Crick, I didn't want to do that. But I, I, I felt God saying, but like that God was using me as a pioneer because God is going to be pouring out so many apostles and prophets. There's, there's such a deficit of them today. We need more. And so God was speaking to me like, I need you to be confident in who I called you to be. I need you to stand strong. I need you to not fear man, not fear people at all. And I need you to be an example. I need you to be an example. I need you to not shy away from your, your identity in Christ, who I've called you to be. But I need you to be confident and obedient in what I've called you to. Um, and also, I want to mention that Women can be used by God to preach, to teach, to lead, to lead churches, to lead ministries. Um, Apostle Paul, he speaks uh, in the Bible and it's been taken out of context so often. Um, he says, let your woman keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, 1 Corinthians 14:34. And 1 Timothy 2.11 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And when you read the scripture, the Bible, you need to look at the context. Sometimes, sometimes Apostle Paul, for example, was speaking prophetically a word for the people in the church that day according to what they were doing in that time. If someone is being really disruptive in my church today, if someone is screaming loudly um, in their flesh, you know, because when you're in the flesh, anything's possible. Anybody can yell anything, yell any kind of um, nonsense, really, <laughs> when you're in the flesh. Um, and some, anyone can do that anytime, right? And so if there was a person or if there was multiple people just yelling in their flesh and it's distracting people from receiving the word of God, then... I would say you should stop 
stop speaking, right? Because the people are missing out from receiving from God. And this is what the enemy is trying to do right now. But that's not me speaking to everybody, be quiet for all time. If it was one girl or two girls or three girls saying that, you know, speaking out, and I were to say, you, the, the ladies here right now need to stop speaking, I wouldn't be speaking that for all women of all time. It was just prophetic in that moment. Paul, when you look at the context, there was women in that day, the culture of what was going around, they were being like kind of rebellious. And so in the church in that time, the women were being distracted, being disruptive, speaking out uh, in a way that was distracting to people and like not with humility and not with order and God's a God of order. So Paul was speaking the wo- speaking to the woman prophetically in that time because of the context, because of what was going on in the church, which, which was having to do with the context of that time, of what was going on culturally in that time with the woman of that time, in that city, in that place in the world. So um, this was not meant to be for all women of all time. And it's quite, it should be quite obvious that it wasn't meant for all women of all time because we see many examples in the Bible of how God, of how God wants to use women and how God did use women. So, for example, um, we see women. We see women as in the New Testament teaching. Priscilla, the teacher, Acts eighteen twenty six. Phoebe was a minister. Romans sixteen one, and we also see prophetesses. Mir- we see Exodus, or we see a prophetess. Exodus fifteen twenty. We see as was Miriam. We see Deborah was a prophetess and judge. Uh, Judges 4.4. 4. So we see even a woman in place of leadership, anointed by God in leadership there, and as well as the anointed in leadership as teacher and minister Priscilla and Phoebe in the New Testament. And we also see that there was Anna the prophetess in Luke 2.36. We also see Huldah the Pro- prophetess, Second Chronicles 34.22. Um, And we also see that women had, women were assisting Jesus in ministry as disciples, Luke 23, 49 and John 11. We also see Mary Magdalene was whom Jesus chose to appear to and he wanted her to speak that he was risen. So he wanted her to deliver the message of the gospel. So if you wanted, if you didn't think women should be uh, preaching, teaching the gospel, why would he choose to appear to Mary Magdalene? So she was the first one to speak of the gospel, the first preacher, the first teacher of the gospel in that instance. And we also see that God pour, up, God pour, his spirit, pour out his spirit upon all flesh, the Bible says, men and women, they will both prophesy, it says. Uh, and... The Bible also says that there are no, there's no free or slave in Christ. There are no men or women in, in Christ. So it means that in the spiritual realm, God loves and sees the, the freed and the slave just the same. Men and women in the spiritual realm, he sees them the same. He can use men and women the same because we are just vessels, but it's God that does everything. So it's, it's not like God comes through me and mixes with my powers, my feminine uh, powers, and then what comes out is this feminine mixture with God, a womanly mixture or something. That's not how it works. You know, you're, the prophetic word you get is straight from God. It's not mixed with a womanly power or something. Um, when you are delivered, it's Jesus himself fully his power casting out the demon. It's not me doing it. I am a vessel of God. So men and women are just vessels of God. So it's God isn't changed in the vessel. God remains God. God can be just as powerful in a man or a woman. In heaven, um, there isn't even marriage. So the man and woman is more of a physical aspect in the spiritual realm 
God sees us as able to be used as vessels just the same. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be encouraged, woman. Be encouraged. All of you, some of you feeling called to be apostles, some of you called to be prophets, some of you it's been prophesied to you, but you've shrunk back. Some of you women have shrunk back because of words you've received from other people, from the ways the devil has tried to stop you from your calling. Do not shrink back, but be strong, be inspired, be encouraged. God, if God can do what he did with me, God can do it for you too. God can use anybody. I am a weak and foolish thing, as weak and foolish as it gets. So God can use you. God can do the impossible in you. Nothing is impossible. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We are going to transition on over to um, Instagram where I'm going to be uh, praying for, for you all one-on-one. -on -one. So I want to encourage you to start coming on over to Instagram if you're on YouTube and Facebook right now and TikTok. My Instagram handle is at Apostle Catherine Crick and it has, my account has 110,000 followers. That's how you can decipher my account. So um, go on over to my page now where God is going to move so powerfully. Before I end the live on YouTube and Facebook, I want to um, declare over every single one of you right now. I see that God right now is breaking off word curses from some of you. There's some of you women out there that, that have received a lot of word curses over your lives um, when it came to ministry. There's some of you who God, you believe, was calling you into ministry, but the word curses stopped you. The words of other people stopped you. I break off these word curses off of you now in Jesus' name. I break off every every assignment from the devil to try to stop you from fulfilling your calling now in Jesus name. I remove all of those words, all of those lies, all of that wrong doctrine that the devil fed in you and that you believed. I, rem I declare that wrong doctrine, I expose it and I declare it to be sent out in Jesus name. There's some of you who were called in in, who, who have been called in ministry, I see. Some of you, it's pastors, some of you evangelists, some of you teachers, some of you apostles, some of you prophets, and you have, you've shrunk back from your calling because you didn't feel good enough. You didn't feel adequate enough. And I also see attacks of the enemy coming from people um, trying to discourage you. I declare all those word curses broken off of you and I declare every scheme of the devil every scheme coming from other people, every spirit of insecurity, live insecurity, it must go out in Jesus' name. There's some of you here who have an apostolic calling, calling, prophetic calling, and you've been fed so many lies of the devil. People have spoken lies of the devil to you. I remove all of those lies in Jesus' name, and I declare every spirit good and is too bad, is too awful, um, that you're not a good enough Christian. All of these lies of the devil, all condemnation, shame, judgment, I declare it must leave now in Jesus' name. And I release this anointing upon you and I declare that the strength of the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Holy Spirit would come upon you now in Jesus' name. I declare you to be strengthened in Jesus' name. I declare you to be bold as a lion in Jesus' name. Nothing can stop God's calling upon your life. Nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to end the Facebook and YouTube live. Um, I think I'm going to restart the YouTube and Facebook live to show, to 